Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar on how to fine-tune foundation models to auto-label trading data. With way of introduction, my name is Nikolai, product manager at Ancord, and I'm joined here today by my colleague, Alexander, who is our ML solutions engineer. We have a packed agenda lined up for us today. First, we'll dive into the proliferation of visual foundation models before zooming in on Meta's segment NFT model. Hereafter, Alex will give a quick one-on-one on fine-tuning before giving a live demo on how to fine-tune SAM and evaluate the results against normal SAM. In the end, we'll compare our results and take any questions from the audience. Please feel free to type your questions in the chat as we go. We've already received a long list of questions from you up front, but we promise any questions that go unanswered we'll get to after today's webinar. Let's dive into it. So, I think we can all agree that the past nine months has been quite the ride in AI. With large language models taking center stage after the release of ChatGPT, followed by an AI craze by investors, entrepreneurs, and media. With this, it is clear that we will reach an inflection point for the industry as a whole. However, language is not the only interesting data modality out there. And for us computer vision practitioners, it is the release of visual foundation models or VFMs for short, that gets us really excited. For us here at Uncode, the most interesting recent developments have been progressing beyond generative VFMs to predictive VFMs with the segment anything model released just a few months ago. Contrary to classic deep learning models, visual foundation models can produce images and now also make predictions based on prompts instead of a learned specification. They're more general in nature, what can be fine-tuned to solve specific business objectives within different domains and industries. These, of course, have a large number of use cases and potential applications, but our primary focus for this webinar will be on the segment anything model and the impact it can have on building better computer vision models for you. To kick it off, I want to shed some light on the three large model groups that are forming in the VFM space. To our left, we see predictive VFMs. These are VFMs that can take a prompt and turn it into a prediction. In the middle, we have generative VFMs, prompt to image. And to your right, we have multimodal VFMs that can either turn text into images or images into text. If we look at who are leading the innovation across these three model groups, we've seen significant innovation from Meta in predictive models with the release of Dino V2 and Segment Anything model, new AI powerhouses, Stability AI and Open AI with generative models such as DALI and Stable Diffusion, and both Open AI, Microsoft, and Google with upcoming multimodal models of which GBT Vision and Gemini are rumored to be released very soon. I don't think I can understate how excited we are at Anchor to play around with these new models and uncover how they can do super cool things and solve some of your problems in the future. Lastly, we've seen a flourishing open source community come together and develop models across all three groups. For today's webinar, though, we'll be focusing exclusively on predictive VFMs. Should you be interested in hearing more about some of the other model groups, please do let us know in the chat or contact us afterwards. We can go into detail at a future webinar or on a call. So, on a high level, how are VFMs built? They all build following the same three-step methodology. First, you create, curate, and annotate a large, diverse data set. Secondly, you develop a scalable and promptable model architecture that supports a wide range of downstream applications. And lastly, you pre-train a model with promptability and generalization in mind, building a base understanding of common objects and scenes. When you decided that you'd like to explore how to use VFMs for your use case, it's important to consider what type of problem you're facing, as this would help you understand whether it's applicable out of the box, whether you should try to fine tune the VFM, or perhaps use it to support your in-house annotation process. At Uncord, we look at this decision through two variables, robustness to error, so whether your use case is very sensitive to errors or insensitive to errors, and use case complexity and diversity, looking at the complexity of objects and scenes, you're looking at to predict and the diversity of the environments you're predicting in. If you, for example, are looking to build a simple fruit identifier or quick prototype with low requirements to error, 
and simple complexity, you could consider using DFM out of the box combined with a simple object detection model. And on the other end of the spectrum, if you have a very complex use case with a low margin for error, such as a complex medical diagnostics problem, you could consider incorporating a fine-tuned VFM into your annotation process. I'd like to clarify here, though, that when you're selecting how to apply a VFM to your problem, there's other factors you should consider, such as the latency requirements for your problem, the performance, the cost, and so on. Okay. Let's unfold two of these use cases in a simplified diagram. On the top row, we see a complex use case with a foundation model integrated to support annotations. Here you'd supply your fine-tuned VFM with unlabeled images and prompts resulting in a set of mask predictions. Next, your QA team of reviewers would review each task and make smaller corrections and add potential descriptive attributes to the mask. Hereafter, you train and evaluate your model before deploying it in your production environment. In the bottom row, you see a simple use case here, you could combine an object detection model, such as Grinding Dino or YOLO, to generate prompts and classes that the VFM can turn into live predictions for model entrance. I hope that gave a baseline understanding for the different types of VFMs and what to consider when applying them to your use case. Let's dive into the segment anything model now. We'll first give a quick overview of SAM, how it was trained, and then we'll move into the fine tuning experiment that we're waiting for today. For the segment anything model, Meta curated 11 million images from the web and external partners. These images were annotated in a three-step process described by Meta as their internal data engine. First step was purely manual annotations. Here the images were annotated manually following the traditional annotation approach. This was used for the first 100,000 images that they looked at. Secondly, they followed a semi-automated process then it created the first iteration of SAM that was trained based on these first 100,000 images. And this was used to support the labeling of the next batch of images using a standard set of prompts, where after a team of annotators would review and edit the mask. This took them to a total of 300,000 images. And lastly, they conducted a fully automated annotation process in their internal data engine. Because at this point, the model has reached a performance threshold where it was possible for the team to fully automate the rest of the labeling process. So they employed a grid prompt methodology with which they labeled the remaining 10.7 million images and also relabeled the 300,000 other ones. After this process was over, the team had accumulated a staggering 1.1 billion masks across 11 million images that they used to train them on. Simultaneously to annotate the data, the team ideated and developed a promptable model architecture for the segment anything model. We'll go into the specifics of the architecture in a bit, but what they ended up with was a model that was prompted using key points, bounding boxes, masks, grids, and text. Lastly, the team pre-trained the final model. Sadly, we don't have any valid sources that exist that actually shows the details of the training process, so we won't touch upon that today. But it's safe to say that it must have been a time-consuming and pretty compute-extensive task for them. So before diving into the same architecture and model fine-tuning, I want to give a quick shout-out to the Encore platform. For our knowledge, we were the first platform in the industry to integrate SAM for production scale labeling and to support complex labeling use cases. We've continuously improved the way you interact with the model on the platform and improved the workflows around it. I'd also like to extend a special thanks to any of our customers that might be listening in today. All of your feedback has been very welcomed in the process and it's super exciting for us to see that the automated labeling capabilities of SAM has improved the speed and quality of your labeling process with us. We're looking forward to further develop the ability to find your same directly in the platform. So stay tuned for this. And if you want to hear more, feel free to reach out after the webinar and we can discuss your specific use case in depth. With that said, I'll hand over to Alex, who will talk a bit about model fine tuning and take us into the experiment for today. Alex, I'll stop sharing my screen and hand over to you. Thank you, Nico. Let me share my screen. Fantastic. So um, today we're going to dive into the details of model fine tuning, specifically fine tuning SAM, but also trying to have uh, a sort of an understanding of a general approach that we can take to fine tuning these large state of the art models that are published by companies like uh, Meta. So firstly, um, what is model fine tuning? 
So um, these publicly available state-of-the-art models um, tend to have you know, very custom architectures, and they're typically supplied with pre-trained weights. So practitioners can uh, check out usually an open source GitHub repo, download the weights for the model, um, and use it for inference. So for SAM, for example, um, we have you know, a range of uh, uh, weights available to us, depending on what kind of size of model we want, um, and then we're able to use it for inference. As Nico mentioned, uh, we integrated this very early on into the main platform so that we could speed up the segmentation workflow uh, of annotators. So we want to make sure that we fine tune models by using uh, both the architecture and understanding the architecture, but also starting from a good baseline. And that baseline is going to be uh, the model weights. The weights will have been generated, uh, for example, as Nico said, over these you know, 1 billion examples, um, and they will have seen a certain uh, you know, range of data. Typically, this data could be quite diverse, but it might miss out uh, specific use cases that you might be interested in using a model for. For example, um, if we've got a model that's been trained on lots of you know, street style imagery um, and images captures from uh, phones or cameras, for example, it might not perform well in a geospatial uh, context because it's a completely different orientation and different type of data uh, that's being looked at. So over this uh, sort of whole flow that we can see here, um, we've got several steps that we need to consider before we start the fine tuning process. So first we need to select a VFM we need to think about uh, a bunch of considerations. For example, um, what is the license on this VFM and are the weights available? Um, what can we actually uh, do uh, from a, a sort of practical perspective there? What's the cost to fine tuning? So uh, if we're thinking about, for example, LLMs that exist, most of which are closed source, um, these are you know, truly enormous models that have cost a lot of money to train. Um, the fine tuning process might be very difficult if they're extremely complex uh, and the Training objectives are not very clear. Um, we might run into trouble. With something like SAM, um, this strikes a good balance between being you know, a, a very large, very complex model um, and being powerful, but also being sort of small enough that we can uh, tune specific parts of it for our use case. The second step is in the data preparation side of things. So we need to make sure that we're going to have uh, you know, a, uh, a set of data that is going to be representative of the task that we want to achieve. We published a blog post shortly after SAM was released, showing an example of this on uh, text data. So this was data that SAM had typically not seen, so scans uh, of images uh, with stamps that had been segmented on them, and we found a big performance boost there. We'll also be uh, showing in this webinar an example on some more visually appealing data. So this is an image of uh, marine clams, uh, which we'll, we'll show in a second. Um, and these, this is a good use case um, because the segmentation masks um, can be quite tricky. Um, it's a low contrast environment, um, and it's an object that maybe uh, SAM has not been fine-tuned to perform well on. We also need to think about our objectives in terms of how we're going to use this for inference. So with a model like SAM, it's a promptable model, we might want to optimize, for example, for the first mask generated from a prompt. SAM can be prompted with bounding boxes or with uh, kind of additive or negative points that you can draw to show you know, the object you want to segment or the background that you want to exclude. Typically, you might be able to see good performance on a very uh, niche object with, for example, five positive prompts and three negative prompts. To accelerate things like an annotation workflow, we might want to optimize this so that we can get better performance with fewer prompts. Thirdly is selecting our fine tuning strategy. So again, thinking about the sort of cost perspectives that we touched on in the first stage, um, you know, how much time we want to devote for this, what sort of architecture and infrastructure do we have available to us to perform the fine tuning and how efficient is this going to be? We also need to think about the uh, future sort of deployment of the model. So once we've fine tuned it, how are we actually gonna be uh, able to use this in a, in a production setting? Then we have the sort of, uh, you know, meet of this uh, sequence, which is the uh, training side of things. And we need to, after having gained a good understanding of the model architecture, we need to think about what we want to optimize for. So I mentioned, for example, wanting to optimize for, uh, you know, good mask prediction on uh, the first few prompts, for example, and select an appropriate uh, uh, loss function to capture that training objective. And also um, uh, sort of think about the types of optimization strategies that will help us get to this objective. For very large models like SAM, for example, um, we need to think also about things like layer freezing. So um, depending on which part of the architecture we want to target, uh, we might not be able to fine tune all of the parameters. 
especially if we're using a small data set. This is typically something we're going to see for fine tuning because let's say we want to label, you know, a thousand images. We want to get the benefits of using a fine tuned architecture quite quickly. So we might want to annotate, you know, 30, 40, 50 representative examples that we've carefully selected through a curation process and then tune the model. So we need to think about how do we get the kind of fastest uh, you know, time to uh, revenue and uplift uh, from a time and efficiency perspective um, relative to the data that we're going to generate manually. Finally, there's that evaluation side of things. And here we're able to uh, see if we've attained the, the objectives um, that we set out uh, at the start around the sort of, uh, you know, fine tuning strategy selection um, and the selection of the underlying model in our training process. And then we can see if we potentially need to go back and try again um, uh, and make any changes there. The evaluation phase is also really important because it helps us understand exactly what the gains are in our fine-tuned model. So, you know, if let's say we've uh, tried to fine-tune for uh, you know better segmentation mask prediction after a bounding box prompt, and then we try and, and use this fine-tuned version for uh, you know the uh, individual points that are being added as prompts, this might not work as well. So it's important to know uh, the sort of regimes in which we're going to be able to use this model and get the best performance once it's been fine-tuned. Great. So um, now we're going to uh, talk a little bit about these various steps and then go into, uh, in, into a sort of live overview of some code that can be used to fine tune SAM. So um, in this, we're going to uh, look at the step step by step uh, sort of steps to fine tune uh, SAM. So looking at the data exploration side of things, so how do we select the right data to start this fine tuning process? We're going to show the results of the fine tuning. So we're going to use an active learning tool uh, that we've developed on Quad Active to understand where is the fine tuned model performing better um, and exactly what sort of uplift have we uh, generated. And then finally, we'll discuss the uh, automation potential again, thinking about that uh, model training loop. So what do we need? This is very similar uh, to that first few steps um, that we saw in the overview slide. So we obviously need some data. So in this example, we're going to be using some data that we uh, took from Kaggle. Um, we're going to need images. We're going to need ground truth masks. And we may or may need, not need prompts, depending on what we want to achieve. So for example, um, if we're looking to uh, replicate human-generated prompts, we might either have humans drop some key points that we can use in the fine-tuning process, or we might have uh, a sort of you know, synthetic uh, prompt generation uh, engine that will generate, for example, points that are similar to those that a human would apply. For a bounding box prompt, we might use the ground truth mask and automatically draw a bounding box around it with various you know, sort of uh, mistakes, or we can make it more or less large, depending on uh, what we're trying to optimize for, and use that as a prompt in the fine tuning process. We, of course, need the model weights from the VFM publisher, um, because we need to make sure we have a good starting point. We're not going to train this model from scratch, because then uh, we, A, won't really get anywhere, and B, even if we did, it would be so overfit that it would not be useful for the rest of our data. We need a good understanding of the model architecture. So as I mentioned earlier, these models can be very big, have lots of parameters, and we need to understand what to fine tune uh, to try and get to our objective. We'll, of course, need uh, a GPU infrastructure. So we need to be able to uh, have this process be something that you know is going to run in, in some reasonable time um, so that we can see results and we can make changes if we need to. And then finally, we need the uh, sort of active learning side of things. So that is from the start, so from the data curation side of things. What data are we going to label to fine tune? Um, and also, how do we evaluate our model? So. The SAM architecture um, has a couple of key components. So we have uh, the image encoder, which will take an image that you want to uh, generate a segmentation mask for and encode it. This has a truly uh, you know, large number of parameters, it's got about 8 billion parameters. Um, so in this particular case, we, we're not going to fine tune that because it's going to be uh, essentially, it's not going to help us achieve our objective. We have a prompt encoder that can take these uh, key point prompts or bounding box prompts um, and encode them. This is something that could be fine tuned. It does not have a huge amount of parameters, but one of the issues is that it sits behind the mask decoder. Um, so if we're trying to back propagate from our uh, you know, final uh, uh, generated mask, um, we've, we've got some issues there in terms of uh, being able to effectively fine tune this layer. 
We also have uh, the mask decoder. So this is what takes the encoded image and the encoded prompt and then generates uh, a mask. This has a large number of parameters, but it's not uh, you know, as large as uh, something like, for example, the image encoder. Um, it's something that we can reasonably expect to fine tune. Depending on, uh, again, the use case um, and the training objectives, uh, we might need to do things like you know, freeze some of the layers in this decoder uh, to make sure that we can, uh, we can fine tune the model properly. So one of the things that I wanted to focus on um, for the model fine tuning piece uh, before we, we go further um, is the image pre-processing step. So models like SAM, um, you know, when they're delivered, when we do have the code, for example, that like we do for SAM, um, they are you know, built to be used in sort of inference mode. Um, that's what uh, the publishers of the model you know, expect people to do with the model. Of course, we want to fine tune it. This is not usually easily achievable just out of the box. You can't just take the model and you know, try and train it uh, straight up. You have to go and look at the model internals, prepare your data and do other uh, uh, sort of transformations. So looking, for example, at the flow of data through the model to achieve the same uh, result and be able to, uh, to start the fine tuning process. So you can see I've got a couple of uh, links here. We have a full uh, blog post with uh, links to various key parts of the uh, SAM architecture, which uh, you can check out later. Uh, but here, for example, for the pre-processing step, if we go into the actual uh, SAM code, so this is in the uh, in, in Meta's uh, repo. So you can see here, this is the segment anything model. We can see um, a couple of things. So we can see, for example, um, here, we've got all of these uh, no grad decorators, which obviously uh, you know, we, we, we don't want to, uh, we, we don't want to have in the fine tuning process because we, we can't uh, optimize. We can go look and understand um, how is SAM pre-processing the data, for example, before the image encoding step. So we see here there's a pre-processing method that's being used. Um, there's also uh, here a, this nice set image uh, function that's being used. So this has two kind of benefits to looking at this. One is to really understand what's going on, try and understand uh, you know, exactly how the model works, which is going to help us in the overall fine tuning process. But also it allows us to take this code out and pre-process our data, for example, um, to be more efficient when we're going through the fine tuning process. So we're going to be using um, two data sets here. Um, one is the stamps data set, which is the one that our blog post, which was uh, featured uh, very shortly after uh, Sam came out, uses. This has around sort of 500 images and masks. Um, the use case here is uh, insurance OCR. So if you've got a bunch of uh, files, for example, uh, where there have been uh, there have been you know, annotations that have been made, we want to make sure that we're able to segment these stamps, for example, efficiently. The second data set, which I think is uh, more fun and visually appealing, is the clams data set. So there's a nice marine life uh, data set on Kaggle, and it has images of these uh, very nice clams. An application for this is, for example, marine conservation. But one of the reasons why it's nice to look at in a fine tuning process um, is what I mentioned earlier. These are quite specific images. You can see these masks are quite tricky. Um, it's a low contrast environment. So for example, this object here, it's not necessarily something that Sam is going to perform well on. We might want to fine tune it for that specific application. So um, how are we going to evaluate uh, SAM? So in this case, we're predicting masks um, and we're going to use uh, the uh, IOU. So we're going to look at uh, you know, what fraction of these masks uh, matches with the ground truth. We can also uh, think about potentially more complex metrics down the line um, where the IOU might not fully capture the performance uh, uh, benefits that we're going to get there um, around sort of mask tightness um, and sort of distance, for example, from the, uh, from the uh, ground truth mask. We'll look at uh, some of the evaluation in more detail when we uh, look at this in our active learning tool. So now we can actually dive into uh, the process. So we're going to look at two things. First, I'm going to show you uh, some of the data set exploration features so that we can prioritize the data that we want to label, understand what this CLAMS data set actually looks like, and then we can dive into the CoLab notebook. So here I am um, in Onward Active. So this is our active learning analysis tool. Um, and you can see that I have my unlabeled um, C animals, specifically the CLAMS. And I have these 497 images. 
We can see some top line stats around uh, the images. Um, so these are metrics that are being computed over the raw data to try and understand, you know, how is this data distributed? Um, potentially, where are we already uh, going to want to uh, focus our efforts on in order to build uh, a representative data set for the fine tuning process? If I dive into the explorer side of things, you can see all of these unlabeled clams here. There is some diversity, um, but we can also find some, uh, some trends here. So for example, um, if I go in and I look at this cluster, we can see that these are sort of uh, beach style clams. Um, and we might think, you know, let's tag all of these and start a subset um, so that we can annotate them and fine tune for this specific use case. This cluster over here um, is going to be extremely sort of blue, um, large clams. Um, and we can also think about targeting these for a specific use case. So it gives us a good understanding of our data. And we can go in and apply uh, tags for prioritization so that we can then, as I mentioned, create those subsets for annotation, but also create a representative subset uh, for the training process. So having gone away and annotated some clams, um, we can actually uh, start the fine tuning process. So you can see um, we have a collab notebook here. Its structure is very similar to the uh, blog post that we, uh, we sent out a few weeks after Sam was published, um, which will again circulate after this, uh, after this uh, presentation. So we can look at a couple of things, go through this in order. Um, you can see that we do some you know, very uh, vanilla sort of setup, um, getting the, uh, the model weights and installing uh, the relevant uh, sort of packages that we need to perform this process. Then um, we are going to pre-process our data. So we used the vanilla version of SAM to pre-annotate some of this data and then manually edited some of the masks because they weren't to our satisfaction. I did this in the Encore annotation platform. And what I'm doing here is I'm essentially accessing my project and downloading um, some of the data. So you can see here, um, I'm getting my polygons and I'm converting them uh, to, uh, to, to masks. Then I have a very sort of straightforward prompt generation code. Again, as I mentioned, we could go with something more complex. Um, so we can generate, for example, point prompts randomly within the uh, uh, within the, the graduate masks. We can also generate bounding boxes. In this case, I'm just generating a box that's very tight already around the mask that we want uh, to use so that we can uh, see what the performance is there. When we'll be doing the evaluation, We'll be evaluating the performance of vanilla SAM and uh, fine-tuned SAM with exactly the same prompt. So there's no sort of you know uh, unfair advantage here to the uh, fine-tuned version. Got a couple of helper functions just to help me visualize the data. Um, you can see here uh, this is one of the clams um, with its uh, prompt, so the bounding box around the uh, segmented clam, and also this ground truth mask um, that's been drawn. As we go further, um, we can actually prepare the, the fine tuning process and start it. Um, in a production application, we'd want to uh, use you know, some more advanced features, so like we'd want to use you know, PyTorch data loaders, um, use things like batching, et cetera. But here, we're just keeping it simple so that we can see what the main principles are. Here, we're pre-processing all of our data according to those internal SAM uh, data preparation uh, steps. So we, it's the same code that we saw in the slides, um, and we're transforming the data so that it's ready um, for, uh, for the fine tuning process. You can see here, um, that there are a couple of you know, quite specific things that SAM expects in terms of uh, you know, the, the, the color space of the image um, and also its, uh, its sort of shape. Here in this section, um, we are looking at the mask decoder. So you can see that I'm looking at the SAM model mask decoder and I'm looking at its parameters. Um, here I'm deciding uh, to only fine tune a uh, sort of prediction head. I could also uh, make different choices. So in the Colab notebook that we released originally, we just fine tuned the whole decoder, which worked quite nicely. For this, for this application, um, we, we, we found that freezing some of the layers uh, worked better. One thing with SAM, which is useful to do, is to um, cache the embeddings. Um, and that's because the image encoder um, is quite expensive to run. Um, it takes a couple of seconds per image, typically. Uh, and because we're not fine tuning the encoder, um, we, can, we can cache these for, for speed. This is something that's also uh, done in a sort of human in the loop process. So if you're using SAM to annotate 
uh, data, it's always better to cache the embeddings just to make sure you can have that really quick uh, sort of process of uh, being able to segment different areas of an image. You can see that I've uh, commented out the points fine tuning because I didn't want to do this. Um, experiments with it, it's quite uh, interesting to do, but in this case, I commented out because we're not going to be uh, doing this in this particular version of the fine tuning. And we're just looking at uh, the first 50 examples of the labeled data set. This is because, of course, we want to then use fine tuned version to uh, annotate data in a production setting. So we don't want to annotate everything in fine tune because then we wouldn't get uh, any sort of advantage of fine tuning itself. Going through, um, again, full code is, is, is will be shared uh, later, um, but we can see uh, here that we are uh, embedding uh, the prompts, uh, and we're also uh, uh, sort of looking at the, uh, the the predictions here that are coming out uh, of SAM. Um, we're then doing a bit of mask manipulation to make sure that the uh, predicted masks can be compared to the ground truth masks, because the uh, SAM does some uh, downscaling throughout the process for the masks. Um, and then we're able to uh, call our loss function to evaluate the performance uh, of SAM and go through that fine tuning loop. Of course, then we can save our model weights so that when we do the performance evaluation, um, we're able to perform inference with the same prompts and the same ground truth data um, with both the uh, fine tuned version and the uh, baseline version of SAM. Great. So once we've gone through this process, we want to actually see what we've done. So through this you know, relatively straightforward example, um, we were able to get an uplift in performance uh, relative to the uh, uh, sort of benchmark or baseline SAM. You can see here, um, we have an example of the mask with the untuned model and the tuned model, which we'll see in a bit more detail in the next slide. But already, even from this sort of fairly zoomed out version, we're able to see that the fine-tuned model is predicting a much tighter uh, mask on this clam-shaped object. Looking at our um, key metrics here, um, so the MAP and the MAR, at a specific IOU threshold, so I said an IOU threshold of 0 0.85, because I think that is uh, uh, you know, a, a good level uh, of performance evaluation for these kinds of masks, um, we're able to see a, a large increase in performance. So what does this mean in practice? In practice, this means that if we have a human in the loop process leveraging the fine-tuned model, we can get to our desired result quicker and more efficiently, um, not only can we get that quicker, but also we'll be generating better quality data because, you know, performing more manual steps to edit masks is going to be more error prone, especially when working with very large annotation projects. Secondly, um, this fine tuned version um, could be used, for example, with a, a, a sort of prompt generation model, uh, as has been covered in a previous webinar by our uh, ML lead. Uh, where we stacked uh, grounding Dino and Sam to uh, be able to predict masks uh, uh, using no, no props there. So looking at these in a little bit more detail, um, we can see our ground truth masks in the bottom left of these two sections. Um, and we can see what the uh, prediction is from the fine-tuned uh, model and from the baseline model. So on the left, we have the uh, example that we uh, we showed in the previous slide. So you can see here the baseline prediction um, includes these areas here, um, which we do not want, which are not part of our ground truth mask. And you can see the difference uh, here in the bottom right. The fine tune prediction is a lot tighter. We could you know train more, have uh, you know potentially more advanced uh, optimization strategies, and achieve an even better result. Similarly, on the right, we can see that the fine-tuned model is already including more of the area of this clam. Um, so in practice, what this means is that if I was labeling this data, um, I would draw my box, and then most of this would already be correct, as opposed to drawing my box and then having to add an additional uh, prompt here to include this area. So um, now we're going to go and look at uh, Onward Active with the results uh, of our fine-tuned and our baseline model and go into more detail as to uh, how performance uh, has changed. So you can see here that I have uh, sea animals clams. That's my baseline uh, uh, prediction. Uh, and I have the fine-tuned model. So if I go into the uh, predictions tab, what I've done here is I've imported in the uh, I've imported in the ground truth masks, and I've also imported in the predictions from baseline SAM, and also from 
vanilla sand in that other tab. You can see here um, that you know, we're looking at this you know, fairly dismal performance from the uh, baseline sand, and we can try and understand why that is. So what regimes uh, uh, sort of data is our model uh, performing badly and is the baseline model performing badly? In? If I go further down here, you can see this metric correlation. So these are the same metrics that we saw in the overview of the data section when we we're doing our data curation. And we can start to understand which ones are correlating uh, well or poorly with the model performance. So we can see here that uh, blueness is uh, you know, strongly correlated with model performance. It makes sense. We sort of identified one of these clusters of blue clams. Um, and this is a, an area where uh, the model might be performing poorly. So we can go and zoom into it in more detail. If I compare this with the fine-tuned version, and I crank up the IOU parameter uh, to the same level as the uh, as the baseline one, we can see uh, the difference in performance. So we can see these headline stats that we saw in the slides. We can also see our true positive and false positive rates uh, for the fine-tuned model. Comparing that baseline model, we can see here uh, again that we've we've had a, a big big uplift in performance. So diving into the blueness metric, um, which we saw is uh, strongly correlated with model performance, um, I can go in and draw uh, uh, this graph. Again, I'll bring up the IOU uh, metric to the same as uh, what we were looking at in the slides. And you can see here um, that the baseline model is performing badly uh, for these clams that have these low values for blueness. Um, the histogram here is the uh, number of samples uh, that are in each bucket, and then the, uh, the, the sort of line is the, uh, is the precision there as a function of the, uh, the blueness. Comparing that to the fine-tuned version, we can see here um, we have you know, much better performance in this low blueness area, and the overall precision curve is a lot flatter. We're not performing well for this extreme value of blueness. Um, that's the only sort of area where the fine-tuned version is not working as well. We might want to dig into that further, um, consider you know, different uh, fine-tuning strategies, maybe train for longer, um, or annotate a bit more data uh, in the uh, blue sec high blue section, because maybe we didn't have enough of that in our uh, fine-tuning process. By going to the uh, Explorer, we can then see what these samples look like. So I can look at uh, the data metrics. I can look at uh, blueness. And again, uh, put a parameter for the IOU here at 0 0.85. What this is doing is it's showing us uh, the ground truth masks and the predicted masks superimposed. Um, and we can, uh, we can see the ones that have been tagged as uh, being you know, uh, correct mask predictions and incorrect mask predictions. So going back to the, uh, uh, the baseline model here, if I go again and look at blueness, I'm looking at the IOU and I can see for these, uh, these examples here, these low blueness examples, which if we recall that precision curve um, were, were ones where uh, the model was not performing so well. And we can see uh, the difference uh, in the predicted mask and the baseline mask. If I zoom in here, just look at this in a little bit more detail, you can see that this mask is very much off relative to the uh, baseline mask. So you can see here it's included this whole area, uh, sort of rock behind the clam, but actually what we're interested in here is the opening of the clam. If I compare that um, to the fine-tuned version, we can see here um, that there are these examples um, where the, uh, the, the new version has performed a lot better. Um, there are still areas of improvement. Um, so we can see here, there is still uh, you know, some masks where it's not performing as well as it could, but overall we're performing a lot better, we're picking up far fewer of these uh, examples uh, where we have uh, a bad mask. So this is the non-fine-tuned version. And looking again at the fine-tuned version, you can see these masks are a lot tighter uh, and of higher quality. So what can we take away from this? Um, we can take away that uh, tuning these VFMs can bring a you know, large performance uh, boost, especially for domain-specific applications where the uh, model will not have seen examples that are particularly relevant to our use case. So in this example, 
we used clams um, in the example of previous blog post. We used you know, text segmentation, which is a, quite a, a specific uh, uh, sort of domain there, um, where Sam had not seen these examples, and we saw in practice that it wasn't performing so well. So again, using these kinds of uh, tools for analyzing the performance uh, of the baseline model, we can decide whether we want to uh, under undergo a, a fine tuning process. The size of the model meant that we had to target a specific part of the architecture. So, uh, you know, we've experimented with uh, trying to fine tune uh, the image encoder, for example, um, and that just, you know, we haven't had any, any, any success there because it's so large. Um, it's much easier to target specific parts of the architecture, go into the underlying uh, kind of open source code and understand how the data is flowing uh, through, the, uh, through the model. Again, the complexity of the tasks means that we need to make specific kind of optimization choices um, just to make sure that we're able to do all of this in a reasonable time to obtain a performance uplift. Finally, um, using tools like Onboard Active uh, allows us to efficiently curate the data at the data selection side of things. Um, that helps us both uh, you know, generate uh, tasks for annotation, for example, uh, but also uh, prioritize uh, the information that needs to go into the fine tuning process. And then once we are in the fine tuning process, um, we need to evaluate the performance of the model. So we need to see whether we've done better. Um, and even before that, even before we un undergo the fine tuning process, we can evaluate the baseline model to understand whether it's worth fine tuning. Doing all of this in a tightly coupled loop um, with the fine tuning process and the annotation process um, using both you know, graphical tools that like we showed here with this presentation, but also, uh, for example, uh, programmatic integrations uh, with a performance evaluation tool like Onboard Active um, helps us uh, get better results and get those results faster. The resources uh, will be shared uh, after the call. Um, we have, of course, the, uh, the, the blog post as well that, it, that will be linked um, that is of, of interest for following these sorts of steps. And now uh, we have not for some Q&A. Thank you very much, Alex. This was super, super interesting. Um, just before we dive into the q and I can see there's another question here regarding the notebook slides and recordings. We will make all of this available to you after this webinar, both on our website, and we'll also share it with you after the call. Alex, you can click the next and let's go over the questions that came in in advance of the webinar before going into the questions from the audience. So first question, can SAM be used to refine existing semantic se segmentation results? Yes, it can. You can use your existing segmentation results as prompts for SAM, and that were used as to generate new segmentation masks. Secondly, can SAM be used to do labeled semantic segmentation? As we've shown during the call today, this is what SAM excels at. It is perfect at doing semantic segmentation. It does output masks, but if you're using a platform like Uncode, you can convert these masks into polygon or whatever type of object that you'd like to do. Can you use SAM to find a specific class? As we covered a little bit earlier, SAM in itself does not predict the class of the object. It only predicts the mask. So you would like to combine SAM in this case with other types of models. So for example, Granite Dino or Yolo V8 to predict the class for you and provide the prompt. Does the model size impact the specific parts of the architecture needed to be targeted for fine tuning? Alex, I'll hand this over to you. Cool. Yes. So as we've mentioned several times, uh, at least throughout the webinar, um, yes. Uh, so, you know, some of these extremely large models, larger than SAM, for example, um, are going to be tricky to fine tune. I think with a lot of these Models, we are somewhat at, uh, you know, we're, we're sort of cusp of, you know, being able to fine tune and not being able to fine tune. Um, again, depending on the complexity of the task, size of the model, um, and the infrastructure available to us, uh, because this can, can can get very difficult um, for the larger models. Um, sometimes, you know, some of these strategies like, uh, you know, deciding to fine tune uh, specific parts of the architecture are not going to work for different kinds of uh, foundation models, um, because you know their architecture is being extremely complex. Um, that's just not gonna not not gonna work. Um, but uh, specifically for Sam, uh, yes, we need to target specific parts of the architecture. More generally, again, it's a case by case basis um, where some of these extremely large models are, are going to be quite tricky to fine tune sometimes. Thank you, Alex. And the next one here, I'm interested in foundation models for also active learning. 
will provide some details where we can use our own models. Yes, currently in the open source version of Arm Collective, you can upload your own model predictions and use those to curate your own data and to set up active learning loops as you wish. Last one, can I train them to recognize damage objects in very diverse situations, sizes and angles for manufacturing quality project with few training images? Alex, if I start here, then you can fill in afterwards. So as we go back to our little 2D plot of the different use case complexities and um, sensitivity to error, if you have a case like this where it sounds like you have a lot of diverse imagery, you have a lot of different situations, we would not necessarily recommend to use SAM as your final model for predictions. Instead, you could use it in your annotation process to create all of your quality annotations and then later down the line, train your final model. Alex, anything to add here? I think that's 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 very accurate. Um, again, like with the fine tuning process, especially when you're working with you know in this case with few training images and very diverse situations, um, it's going to be really hard to attain that you know, objective uh, from the fine tuning process. You could do you know something like you know recognize a few categories, let's say, of situations. Um, let's say you know some of them are uh, you know inside engines some of them are let's say we're talking about a, a plane engine for example um some of them could be in the combustion chamber and some of them could be in the uh, fan blades for example those are two very different situations um you could categorize off that basis do uh, grouping for example with a curation tool like Uncode Active fine tune two separate models and then you could have a, a third model that you build in order to decide which one to use, for example. Uh, but again, yes, if there's going to be very little, uh, you know, very few data points um, and very diverse situations, that's going to be that's going to be quite tricky. Okay, Alex. Then let's go into the live questions from the Q and A here. From Eric, I have a question. How long time did it take to fine tune the claim data set? Well, in terms of yes, um, so um, in terms of the the process, um, you know took you know best part of a sort of day to start setting things up um specifically because uh it was a trickier data set to fine tune on than uh for example the uh the the, the text data set um, that we had in our blog post so it required a little bit more uh sort of uh, hand holding there um in terms of the actual like compute time um we're talking sort of on the order of tens of minutes hours um not not sort of you know weeks uh, so uh, order of magnitude of sort of intraday for that for that process. Thank you. Then we have a question here from Aro. In the active learning tool, I saw the part on viewing performance metrics and visualizing results. But what tools do we have for selecting the most important erroneous points for annotation and correction? So for Uncorrective, we have two different versions. We have an open source version and a deployed version. In both versions, you can do a label error selection. That means you can upload your model predictions and use those to find label errors in your data set. You can also use a variety of different quality metrics, as Alex showed earlier, we have one of them called annotation quality metric, where we're looking at the quality of your annotation and comparing it to the rest of the annotations in your data set to find the most, uh, the outlier labels that are, that could potentially be errors and then sent back for annotation. We'll build a close loop between our annotation and our active learning platform so sending this back and forth is a easy and simple process. Then we have from Aaron Lee, it feels like the finding tuning process can take quite a long time and be odorous. Can it be done by one person or is it a team-wide effort? Alex, over to you. Cool. So, I mean, it, it can be done uh, by one person. Um, I did, did it myself, um, but, you know, in again depending on the situations so um, you mentioned this you know, engine example uh, so manufacturing uh, use case um, that could be something that's going to be much harder to do potentially might have to be a, a team-wide effort um, personally like I, I have found you know that this can be a, a somewhat arduous and experimental process um, the best way to go about it of course is to try and automate you know all the hyperparameter optimizations so that you can find the best strategy for fine-tuning um, can be, you know, can be something that's harder for uh, very, very non-standard um, kind of data sets. Um, so yeah, again, use case specific, but, you know, when we were first doing the fine tuning for SAM, for example, with the stamps example, um, it took a little bit of 
handholding to uh, stop, for example, our optimizer from going crazy uh, and just like exploding the loss function and then having you know something that doesn't work. Um, so yeah, again, there's no sort of you know uh, silver bullet answer there, um, but it, it really depends on the use case complexity. The simpler the better. Um, simpler and niche is like the best fine tuning regime because it means that you've got data that looks quite consistent. Training relatives are really clear um, and it's niche, so that it's worth fine tuning. So you know you can fine tune these models. Um, if it's going to be something you know really complex and diverse, then you're going to have a difficult time fine tuning unless you have a lot of data and uh, you know a lot of compute power and a lot of you know top ML engineers to uh, do this in a in a very uh, you know scientific and, and large scale process. Next one. If there are two or more objects in one image, can same be used to segment them both? Yes. In this case, as long as you're providing prompts for both objects or multiple objects in an image, same can segment all of them. If you're, for example, using Uncode's platform for, for segmenting these different images, you would simply provide one prompt for the first image, hit enter, and then a prompt for the second image and hit enter. Then, as I can see, we still have a bunch of questions here. So let's go a little bit over time. There's a question here on the best model to detect very low contrast structures from NIRAND-D. And specifically, he's talking about the three types, uh, SAM, VIT, and then, well, let's take SAM and VIT. You see the third one here is not really written out completely. Cool. Um, so, the, um, yeah, I'm un unmuted. Um, the main sort of uh, consideration there is, uh, you know, if you're going to fine tune or not, so um, between B, L, and H, H is going to be the best ones. So they they stand they're sort of representative of the different uh, sizes of the model. Um, obviously, fine tuning the biggest one is going to be extremely difficult. Um, so you know the B model is the one that I selected here because it's the lightest one, and so it's easier to fine tune. Um, if you wanted to uh, fine tune the uh, largest one, which I think is uh, H. Um, that is something that's going to be really difficult and tricky. Um, again, we're already, I think, quite at the limit of the uh, kind of you know, parameter numbers and the complexity of the architectures for fine tuning to happen on these small data sets. Um, so, yeah, it, it depends. Again, it's the sad answer. Um, but yeah, you want to select the one with the lowest uh, and smallest model in order to be able to, to fine tune it uh, properly. Um, one thing for low, low contrast images is you can do more kind of uh, data pre-processing to try and bring out like specific features um, before you then pre-process to input into, into SAM. Super. Moving on to next one. Here from anonymous attendee. Thank you for the presentation, Alex. I tried to run your collab notebook with stamps and it worked fine. Then I loaded my own data, checked everything was okay, but the model didn't learn at all. Loss was all over the place. What could be the issue? It needs to be mentioned that my data is very different from what Sam was pre-trained on. Would this potentially mean I need to fine tune the image encoder? Thank you. Oh, yes. So again, this is similar to the uh, answer I gave uh, previously. Um, you could try and fine tune the image encoder. Um, see, see, see how you, you get on. Um, I think it's, it, it's going to be tricky. I've tried doing it. Um, it doesn't always uh, work because of the complexity of the encoder. Um, I think in in that use case, um, again, I don't know what the underlying uh, data is, um, but uh, but you might just have to experiment with a lot of different uh, you know optimization strategies, see which ones work best. Um, the loss can be absolutely all over the place. I've seen it for some other fine tuning use cases, um, and so it just takes a bit of handholding and mainly experimentation to get these uh, these things to work. Um, once it really starts going the wrong way. Uh, it, it really starts going the wrong way. Um, so, you know, things like, you know, doing some learning rate scheduling, like checkpointing, doing some early stopping, these kinds of things like might help you uh, get a get better performance. Uh, but mainly, yes, just try and try and do some hyperparameter optimization um, around everything that's present in that uh, fine tuning process. Um, and hopefully you'll get some, some good, good results there. Yeah, and here, if, if, if you need someone to ideate with, please do, uh, do get in touch and, and Alex and I can jump on a quick call and take a look at your use case here. Second to last question, Alex, what kind of minimal GPUs are required to fine tune the same? 
Sure. Um, so um, the ones, the standard ones that are available in uh, Colab um, tend to work well. So there's there's T4, um, there's uh, there's uh, A4 as well. Uh, sorry, A A100. Um, we we've done it uh, with with a, a range of them. So again, it. Uh, it depends on the use case if you want to go really fast and you've got a lot of complex data and you want to fine tune for example you know the whole model um that's going to be something where you need a, a beefier gpu um but otherwise yeah things like the a t4 gpu or uh you know the a100s uh will, will work nicely those are all available like on most cloud platforms um like on, on gcp for example you can you can use these and the cost is not too high, uh, especially for things like the the smaller ones, like T4 is a couple of dollars, I think, an hour. It's not huge. Thanks, Alex. And last question of today. Can you touch upon deploying SIN? Is it safe to just fine tune and deploy it for use cases, or does it make sense to combine models? I can start here, Alex, and then you can fill in afterwards. So yes, it is safe to deploy SAM. But how, you should be cautious of the latency requirements that you might have for your use case. And you should also be cautious of which classes are you actually looking to predict. Now, you mentioned here that you want to combine it with other models. You might either want to combine it with the YOLO V8 model, with a fast ICNN, or with a branding dyno model to make sure that you're predicting the correct classes for your SAM mask here as well. Oh, yeah, the only thing I'll uh, add to that, similar to what you said there, Nico. Um, around the fine tuning process and then you know, deploying a uh, model. I think you just want to make sure that you've got good kind of, uh, you know, performance evaluation during that model, you know, the use life cycle of that model to make sure that, uh, you know, A, you're, it's not actually doing worse than the original SAM. So if you fine tune on some data, you deploy SAM, you use it, it turns out the data that you're, uh, you know, processing changes over time. You've got some kind of uh, data drift there. Um, it's possible that your fine-tuned version will actually start to perform worse than the baseline SAM. So you want to really guard against that uh, and make sure that you don't end up deploying something that ends up being worse in the long term. Um, so really just monitoring its use. Uh, but otherwise, yes, I think it's, it's perfectly, perfectly safe um, as long as you've got some monitoring and you understand, as I mentioned earlier, like the regimes of operation of this model. So, you know, you've really fine-tuned it on these, you know, uh, very dark geospatial images. That's what it's going to be used for. Um, if you then start putting bright, you know, TikTok videos, it's probably not going to work very well, and it might work worse. Okay, Alex. Thank you, everyone, for participating today and tuning into our webinar. Stay tuned for future webinars, and stay tuned for our message with all of the information, slides, and notebooks from today.